Hello, and welcome to this session on placing gender parity at the heart of the recovery from this virus that has devastated so many parts of our economies, our lives, and also sadly taken away too many lives. I'm Mina al -Rabi. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of The National here in Abu Dhabi, and I'm delighted to be moderating this discussion today. It is an important discussion on many levels. Firstly, women have been particularly impacted by COVID-19. Uh, statistics show that while women make up 39% of the global workforce, they've accounted for 54% of total job losses, according to McKinsey. Informal workers have experienced a 60% fall of income in the first month of the pandemic. And according to the ILO, 740 million women are in informal employment and most likely are the most vulnerable. The numbers and the figures are staggering. And we're here today to discuss what can be done to mitigate against all of these developments. Um, everything from the fear of more women and girls getting pushed into extreme poverty to how workplace practices can be improved, but also what are some of the learnings we've taken during COVID-19? There are some silver linings. What have we learned from that? What policy measures have happened that we can actually take up on? We are delighted that there is a global audience watching us um, at, through the World Economic Forum and also on the Nationals platforms. This conversation will be on the record and recorded for the next 30 minutes. And after that, we will go into a private discussion with the forum, forum participants and partners. So while we discuss these issues, I would like to make reference to the World Economic Forum's multitude of programs that are targeted the issue of gender parity, including closing the gender gap accelerators. There are 10 countries that have signed up, including Egypt. Um, and we are delighted that we have a representative uh, from Egypt to discuss um, closing the gender gap accelerators, but also hardwiring gender parity in the future of work, uh, a key component of the work of the World Economic Forum. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, welcome the, the, the speakers on this panel. We have with us uh, Her Excellency Rani al mashak Minister of International Cooperation of Egypt, uh, Kevin Sneeder, Global Managing Partner from McKinsey and Company, Fumzili Malambo Nguka, Undersecretary General and Executive Director of the United Nations Entity for Gender Equality and the Empowerment of Women, which of course all of us know, UN Women, and uh, Michael Niedorf, uh, Chairman, President and Chief Executive Officer of Centene in the USA. Um, Kevin, I'd like to start with you, please, because I know McKinsey has been tracking the issue of gender parity for years, but of course is also monitoring the impact of COVID-19 across uh, societies and workforces. So I want to ask you, how much of a setback are we actually facing for women in the workforce and their participation in the labor force, and how do we tackle it? It's a very serious setback, dramatic setback, because we're really now at a crossroads. After decades of progress, and let's be clear, the progress has been slow, but nevertheless, it has been in a generally positive direction. We now see very significant impacts on multiple dimensions. And let me just bring that to life. And you've already done that, you know, with some of the statistics. But there are a couple that I think really dramatize just how significant this moment is. 80% of the 1.1 million who dropped into out of the US workforce in September were women. 80% of the 1.1 million who dropped out of the US workforce in that month alone. In India, women are two and a half times more likely than men to be negatively impacted in terms of their economic well-being. Women's jobs are 20% more at risk simply because of the sectors that have been hardest hit in this moment. Think accommodation, hospitality, and so on, retail. Uh, female poverty rates are up 9%. That's versus a decade decades of progress. So that's a huge setback. Up to a quarter of women, women are thinking of stepping out of the roles in which they are in today in the developed economies. So there are multiple measures in which you look at this and you think this is dramatic. And it's why, as we talk about what's needing to be done, we really need to pull all levers, starting with the recognition that the number one thing we often have heard and we found in our most recent analysis of what is it people are looking for in order to make progress in gender parity, the number one thing we often hear is flexibility. Well, in this moment, there is that opportunity, but it hinges on, for example, digital inclusion, making sure women have access to digital tools, 
and they are disproportionately negatively impacted there. It means social means, for example, unpaid work. Women take on by far the greatest burden of unpaid work. Think childcare. What are we going to do to make that addressed and possible to be uh, redressed as a source of obstacle? I could keep going. This is a dramatic moment. We are undoubtedly at a crossroads. When, when you speak about flexibility, that's a very important point because some of that is depending on particular uh, companies or particular sectors. But how can we actually get that flexibility to be part of policy measures? And here I want to bring you, Rania, into the conversation because can you give us examples of success where policy measures have allowed women uh, to have uh, better circumstances in the workforce, and particularly when it comes to the issues of flexibility. Uh, uh, thank you, Mina, and uh, very happy to be joining uh, Davos uh, colleagues virtually uh, this year. Uh, gender uh, issues are uh, extremely uh, important, and for countries uh, which have endorsed SDGs, SDG number five, which is gender equality, uh, is a key one. Uh, and in the past, before COVID, uh, there has been so much statistics put out that shows uh, that economic uh, that women's participation in the economy is macro critical so it's no longer uh, just a number but it's actually uh, an increase in gdp and an increase in productivity uh, covid of course uh, came uh, all of a sudden uh, many uh, countries and policymakers had to think uh, how not just to uh, protect uh, citizens per se, but also uh, not renege on many of uh, the very important, uh, uh, I would say, uh, uh, one uh, 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 issues related to uh, different topics, including gender. Um, and I will just give uh, uh, a few examples. Uh, suddenly, the government had to work remotely and a decree was issued uh, where uh, women uh, could uh, actually uh, take leave with the children who are uh, below 12 years old. So this was done in legislation. So policy making uh, was quite important uh, in formulating that. Second, trying to provide training for digital uh, skills for women to be able to equip to the um, uh, changing circumstances. Uh, in our case, we were one of the uh, very first countries to have gender sensitive policies post-COVID, uh, and by the UNDP in doing assessment for countries, uh, Egypt was singled out as the number one in uh, West Asia uh, and the Middle East with 21 gender sensitive policies. Uh, these policies are related to um, uh, women's security, violence, uh, child care, et cetera. And of course, uh, everyone realized uh, in that, you know, uh, the unpaid work became even more obvious and more visible with COVID, particularly with education being uh, uh, from home and so forth and everything being digital. So I think that um, uh, uh, in our case, uh, we have not uh, given a blind eye to the uh, gender issues. Uh, we've tried to internalize uh, and endogenize the, the new realities into uh, what the government is formulating to uh, basically tackle and mitigate impact uh, of COVID. And as you mentioned in your introductory remarks, Mina, uh, Egypt uh, joined uh, the World Economic Forum um, uh, to launch uh, the gender gap, uh, closing the gender gap accelerator. We are the first country in Africa and the Middle East. And this is uh, a public-private platform. And so in the spirit of stakeholder capitalism and having um, uh, all parties engaged in trying to push forward uh, the agenda uh, on sustainable development goals, including SDG number five, uh, we're very happy and proud that uh, we initiated this. Uh, and the idea is that policymaking do its role, private sector be part of creating these policies so that they are uh, basically uh, creating more impact uh, across the society with women participation being uh, uh, quite uh, prominent in this. Thank you so much, Rania. Equally, it's going to take the public sector and the private sector, of course, um, to, to tackle this issue. Fonzili, if I can please move to you and ask you about examples of uh, public policy or incentives that you've seen as successful, but also how to address the concern about more women sliding into extreme poverty. Again, that number of 47 million more women and girls possibly sliding into poverty due to COVID-19. Fonzili, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, well, I have to say it's a uh, not easy at this point to stay successful because uh, 
uh, you know, we haven't been uh, ex experiencing the initiatives that the governments have taken for a time that is long enough for us to know that uh, it is successful. But let me say it is alleviating the extreme pressures that the women were feeling. Uh, one good example is Senegal. Uh, women who grow rice uh, uh, and uh, would otherwise sell into the market as a result of lockdown and all of the uh, routes that they were using for supplying were disrupted. Government was buying all of the rice that the women were, were producing and using it to support feeding schemes. They have now gone into a formal relationship uh, with government where women will, which is ideal for us, uh, women will be supplying governments, which is also trying to reduce the import of rice uh, into Senegal because they, they can grow more rice within the country. Uh, but also, you know, we have been talking about women who are in formal jobs, uh, you know, starting with the health workers, uh, ensuring that uh, uh, as a result of what we have experienced in the pandemic, we have advised uh, uh, governments about the importance of making that the conditions of service for women are much better. That uh, in, in, in situations where many women were saying that they are doing casual jobs, their contracts are not secured, and we know that health workers are so important, no, there is no denying we all have seen that. Uh, we have been advising that governments formalize, use this time to formalize the types of contractual arrangements that they have with women beyond the health sector. In tourism also, where women tend to be casuals, waitresses, etc., uh, when they have to claim, it's much more difficult because of their precarious contracts. So we are urging governments as they give stimulus were uh, urging development banks as they give and support us to make sure that they ask that women are also uh, supported and they are put into formal contracts. Thank you. Thank you so much. The issue of casual wor workers in formal economy is quite important, as you said, health workers. And with that, uh, Michael, I'd like to turn to you. On the role of businesses in improving um, the situation for women, particularly those working in the healthcare sector, but also the importance of equitable access to healthcare benefits. Um, what are your learnings and what would be your advice? Uh, well, I, uh, I, I may be a little atypical in this regard. Um, we, uh, we start at the top. I have two members of the board of directors that are very senior experienced women. One was a vice chairman of Deloitte, and one was the first four-star uh, general in the uh, Air Force. And so from the top down, everybody understands that you can achieve it if you're a woman in this company. We've also said we don't have programs to hire women specifically because we want everybody in this company to know that somebody's in the job because they're the best person for the job. Now, we support gender parity, and we moved uh, 66,000 people home in three days when COVID hit and ensured they had the support and the systems and things necessary. We still have three, 4,000 doing essential. We've also hired about 7,000 people virtually uh, since COVID hit a year ago. And that's kind of atypical of where things are at. But I think one of the things I'd like to point out is, that, and we're very proud of, that 75% of our workforce are women, that 64% are supervisor and above, and 55% are director level and above. We also have 54% uh, of our interns, 52% of our people are people of color, and uh, in the UK, for example, even internationally, the heads of our UK and Spanish operations, the presidents, are women. So I always tell people, kind of tongue in cheek, that as a Caucasian male, I'm the minority in this company. And I think, I think that's, but everybody's there because they've been the right person. And I think that's kind of important. But you want to be intentional in helping people understand that that could happen. And as we work through COVID, we're also recognizing that they have children at home 
and that you know they're not going to be able to come back to work as fast as they might otherwise, some of them. So we take that into consideration as we start to bring the workforce back. And we're planning that those individuals will come back probably in September because that's when their children hopefully will be back in school. And there are good indications that that, that could happen. So, you know, it's a, we have a robust leadership development. We have inclusion programs for women. And I, I think what's important is have these programs in place and maintain them. And uh, I, think it, I think if anything, we'd like to be an example that it can be done, is being done. And in general, uh, in healthcare, I think in particularly, it is uh, if you, when you watch the news, you watch everything, uh, there is a, a lot more gender parity probably than we're seeing elsewhere. And uh, we're proud of that kind of track record, and we insist on it. And uh, so, I mean, it's one-on-one -on -one tutoring. It's free counseling and mental health services, behavioral health services for people when they do have issues. It's enhanced caregiving, paid time off when they have to. We understand those kinds of things. Extended emergency sick leave. So these are the kinds of things I think we have to do, and we're continuing to offer child care. We have a, uh, a child development center. Where, um, so it's more than just child care. So I, I think those things have helped us attract the women we want, retain them. And uh, I think, if anything, I'd like to say we'd like to say it can be done. That, that's an important message, actually, that it can be done, but there are very specific measures that allow it to, to happen. Thank you, Michael, um, for giving us those examples. Kevin, I want to turn back to you because we're talking about gender parity as we, we come into hopefully a recovery soon once we see um, some traction in, in emerging from this pandemic. Um, but there's a lot of demand on, on companies, on governments of what to focus on with the reset, with the recovery, be it uh, the uh, climate change, be it economic growth, et cetera. So how do you ensure gender parity doesn't get lost amongst all of these demands? Well, I think you listen to what Michael said and you remind yourself that there is plenty of evidence and we've helped contribute to that that shows that companies that actually are more diverse in general, but let's take gender as a, a flagship part of that diversity, tend to outperform those that are not. And we've got statistics that show that they're 25% more likely to outperform. So it's worth reminding ourselves that in general, diversity does connect with performance. And when you remind yourself of that, plus the reality that if we look across the labor force and think about what's needed to respond to the challenges that we've got now, it's good business to make the investment in parity and not to somehow or other think it's optional. It's not optional. I think going beyond that, it is also, of course, the case that a lot of companies, as Michael has illustrated, have been investing over time in this topic because they know it makes sense to do so. The notion that now is the right moment to pull back and prioritize other things, I think is just plain wrong. And so there is just this necessity that it ties to performance. Remember that. And then look at what we're actually talking about. What we're talking about is how do you retain people you've had? Because the retention is going to be the big issue. I mentioned that we had surveys showing that about a quarter of senior American women in the labor force were considering downshifting or stepping out. That is an enormous cost to a business. Think about the investment that's been made in training and developing people. To lose that talent is almost unthinkable from an economic point of view, let alone, as I've said, I think just the common sense view of what it takes to perform. And you add to that that some of the things that need to be done in general will help all employees, gender regardless. So, for example, greater forms of social leavers, funding and provision of health, of childcare, as Michael talks about, family-friendly policies, rethinking how performance reviews are done. That's just good business too. So I utterly reject the notion that somehow or other there's a trade-off here. This is inherent to how this recovery is going to be successful. It's good business and it makes sense. And we should not take this moment and somehow or other think that we're trading off a green recovery for a gender parity recovery or for just a plain economic recovery. This is all connected. We need to move forward in all fronts and pull all levers accordingly. Thank you, Kevin. I mean, it's it, your point about we shouldn't step back is also what, Rania, you were referencing in your initial remarks, that there has been some uh, you know, movement forward and we have to make sure we don't regress. But I want to um, come to you, Rania, to build up on, on the points that you made earlier about measures and legislation that was actually taken to allow mothers of those who are under 12. Do you think that there are further steps in terms of actually legislating that can be seen in the immediate future? Of course, on the long term, we know what's needed, but in the immediate future as, as the world uh, tackles the pandemic? 
Uh, well, you know, um, uh, Kevin mentioned something very important, and that's uh, uh, evidence-based policies. And uh, when countries uh, have the political commitment and the political will, uh, investing time in you know, collecting that data so that your policies are well targeted, whether they are related to uh, health issues, whether they're related to uh, making sure that the daycare centers are available where needed, uh, making sure that uh, you are providing uh, a dialogue with the private sector because you want them to be uh, also uh, uh, the employer of choice uh, because everyone wants to move uh, forward with their GDP. And I think McKinsey had a very important uh, statistic that if we move uh, towards disparity, GDP globally goes up by $13 trillion, and that is a big number. And given where we are today globally, uh, uh, you know, that extra uh, addition to uh, GDP and to productivity is quite uh, is quite uh, important. Uh, a few policies which are, uh, 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 you know, uh, in the forefront, uh, financial inclusion for women is very, very important. Uh, making sure that uh, digital skills are available uh, for women is quite important. Uh, also, uh, when we take a look at uh, some of the uh, loans, uh, entrepreneurship, you know, pushing entrepreneurships that are led uh, and startups led by women, um, uh, the small and medium enterprises led by women, providing technical assistance, capacity building. So all of these uh, are uh, uh, policies that uh, the government pushes. And as I mentioned, uh, having the private sector with us, the civil society with us, because given the widespread uh, networks uh, of civil society to reach uh, to the different governorates is also quite uh, quite important. So as I mentioned, it's 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 not uh, government only. Government always provides the infrastructure required uh, to have collective action uh, from all stakeholders. But the most important thing uh, is uh, the political commitment and the understanding uh, that in the different projects that we do, the gender component uh, is uh, is important. Thank you very much, Mania. Um, Kamsiri, I want to come to you to discuss the societal impact. You know, we're talking about the government government measures, what can the public sector and private sector do, but also there's been a huge societal impact. There have been numerous reports coming out where women, as they're having to stay at home more, but also concerns about the rise of domestic violence during lockdowns and so forth. So I'd like to ask you your thoughts on that and, and also the societal impact of what's happened and, and how can we mitigate against some of the adverse effects? In a time of crisis, uh, you are able to push forward on issues that you have been trying to push forward over a very long time. During the crisis, we were able to reach out, of course, with the help also of the Secretary General, to about 444 countries and heads of states on the issue of investing and, I, and providing more resources to address the issue of violence against women, ensuring that uh, services that women need when they experience violence are designated as essential services. Because as you know, violence against women is a shadow pandemic. It was there before the health pandemic. It will be there beyond the health pandemic, not unless we make decisive changes as we deal with the pandemic. So what we have requested from governments, not only should they be regarded as essential services, but we are asking governments and we'll be announcing that as part of our generation equality campaign, that the police forces, the legislator, I mean, sorry, the, uh, the, the judiciary, all of those uh, uh, officers that dispense justice be regarded as the frontline workers for ending gender-based violence. Because the level of intensity that is required in order for violence against women to be addressed uh, uh, effectively, that intensity has not been reached yet. So we are able to have that conversation right now with different governments about really upping their game. In fact, in two days' time, we are going to be having a conversation with the police forces of countries around the world just on this issue of how they can repurpose their interventions, their action, in order for them to be responding much better in the issues of violence against women. If there's time, I would also like to come back on the issue of a, a child care and unpaid care work. But on violence against women, we certainly are pushing for the uh, policies to be intensified 
as much as possible, not just to be left to civil society. It's too difficult and too dangerous to be left to the people who don't have the means, the authority and resources. And please go ahead with elaborating on the issues of child care, hugely important. So we'd love to hear your views. Please do go ahead. Well, I mean, the, just the point that I, I, I wanted to uh, uh, make, uh, agreeing uh, with what Egypt was, was saying, uh, is the importance of providing the infrastructure uh, that would enable uh, women to stay and to enter the labor force without the, the, the burden of having to be the caregivers for children and old people at home. In a study that we did with IFC, we, did, we looked at South Africa and Turkey by just providing compulsory uh, child care uh, that is accessible and affordable, you increase jobs, you enable women to enter the private, fo the, 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 the labor force, you enable children to get better uh, uh, engagement for them to prepare uh, because you, you send them to a facility that is purposed uh, for that matter. So there is a lot of benefits if government invests in this infrastructure that takes away the burden of care from women and makes it something that is uh, and provided as a public good. Thank you very much. Yes, this idea of that provision being a public good, being for the benefit of all society. Michael, I, I want to come to you for the final comments before we close this part of our discussion. You know, you spoke about the measures um, that your company has taken and ensuring that women are, are fully participating. Um, and we have a question from one of the people in, in the audience who are watching asking, how do we go beyond a checklist of, you know, these are gender equality me measures and move towards a culture where diversity is the norm? If I may, I just want to make one quick comment on the education side to just follow up on what was just said. I cannot emphasize enough how important it's been. And it's a child development center, not just a daycare center. I mean, it has a STEM classroom for the children. And the parents love it because they see the child's development. And when they go into, in the, in, into the public school sector, they're already ahead of the game. So I think doing that and following on was just said that there's nothing more important than that. Now, looking back at the criteria and the checklist, I think what, what we think about is, do we have the organizational structure to support it? Now, whether it be uh, people with disabilities, women, male, no, we have committees that work on that. And the, the, their focus is to ensure that we're maintaining an environment that understands it. And we, we, have, we have what we call courageous conversations where employees are encouraged to come in and talk to us and we, you know, we put board members on it so they're free to talk and express what their concerns are if they have any. Because we tell people, if we don't know about it, we can't do anything about it. And so we try to maintain on that checklist a very open environment. And then, you know, if I, it sounds like a commercial, it's not, but I would want Kevin to know we work with David Nott and his New York team. And even when we do acquisitions, we do a lot of them, they help to ensure that when we're blending the organizations, that, uh, that those principles are, and that culture is in the new, in the new, in the new structure. So it's, uh, it's that kind of checklist, I think, that makes a difference, Mina. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, and, and that's a, a great point to make because on some levels, it is the culture and it is the wider approach, but it's also then the very tangible measure is everything from having the Child Development Center to ensuring legislation is there in particular countries to working with the police forces or the Senegal example is brilliant about you know women who couldn't go out and sell the rice. Well, actually, the rice was bought from them and, and gave a, a general good to, to the public and those who were consuming that rice. Thank you for your very candid remarks and very tangible uh, pointers and advice for us. Thank you very much.